welcome to this journal entry number two, which is going to be about how I'm editing these videos. I haven't made any kind of editing tutorial before, so I'm curious how this will all go. And I want to say it's going to be probably a pretty long video because I'm going to try to make it as detailed as possible. So if you wanted to take a second now to grab a cup of coffee or tea and also maybe to grab a notebook so that you can take notes as we go along, take a second now to do that. Um, I got a journal recently which has sort of re-inspired the way that I'm looking at my YouTube channel. I got this and I made this little Lizzie McGuire type version of myself to paste on the front. And I like the idea of having the pages in this correspond with the videos that I'm posting on this channel. And so I thought I would make this editing tutorial as the second entry so that if you wanted to start a virtual journal like this and sort of come along with me, we can do it together. I would love to see how like you approach it and like little snippets of your life. If you already have a channel or you already edit videos and you just wanted to get an idea of how I've been putting together some elements in my video, I hope that this will be helpful for you. I'll link a bunch of stuff in the description box because there are so many high quality, super professional tutorials for free on YouTube that you can watch, especially to get started with some of the editing software. I use Adobe Suite, which is very in-depth, and in being so in-depth, it's also quite expensive. I think that there are several less expensive options, and in this video, I'll try to mention as many alternatives to using Adobe Suite as I can. So I'm going to take you through my editing flow in detail, and it's going to roughly go in this order, so you get a feel for what's coming. I start by pulling footage in from across the different cameras, I put them all in one folder, I clean out from there, and make a very general rough cut of what I want the flow of the video to be like. At this point, I will add in music, which I think is the most important step in editing. After I've cut my footage to the music, I will add in voiceovers. I will then finalize the edit and add the intro, pulling highlights from the body of the video to flesh out that intro. Usually in the process of creating the intro, I will set up my tablet and start doing hand-drawn animations, text, and little doodles. Then I will add physical elements and last I will add any typewriter animation that I want and other text and watch it through and export. I wish it took as long as what I just said. <laughs> just know that coming into this that this does take a lot of time. So step one is organizing all of the footage that's coming in. This is important because this kind of sets the foundation for the rest of your editing process to not be a chaotic mess. I use this USB adapter because my laptop doesn't have a USB port and this allows me to connect a card reader that reads four different card types, my external hard drive, and I can connect my camcorder with the USB cable. Getting all of the files onto your computer can be a bit of a hassle when you're using several different cameras, especially if you're using older digicams with varied memory cards. So keeping all these accessories in one place and having a method will save you a lot of frustration. I then create a folder on my desktop for the video I'm editing. I watch through the footage from the devices to get a feel for what I'm working with, and I'll sometimes start filtering things out if I know what I need. I make a folder for each of the sources within the video folder so that it's already organized when I import the files into my Premiere project. Once I have the files organized, I can just drag them into my project bin and I'll be able to select from there to pull them into a sequence. Premiere will create sequence settings based off of the first file that you drop into the timeline, and so I always like to start with any DSLR footage I have because it's the best for YouTube. I always try to name the sequence based on the content so I can easily find it later. I like to think of sequences as the different chapters or scenes that will be put together later and I make all my sequences match the sequence settings from what was created with that DSLR footage and then resize any other footage so it will be easier to put together later. The cuts I'm making at this point are mainly just to clear out likes or ums and blank space, and I'm not shaping the video at this point. So for adding music, I want to talk to you a little bit about the sponsor of this video, which is Thematic. Thematic is a platform that connects musicians to creators, which 
I personally just love because I consider myself to be both. I've been making my own music for videos recently and I have to say that though making your own background music is really really fun, it does add a significant amount of time to the process. If you don't have experience making music, you don't like making music, but want to still make really special and unique videos, I think that getting your hands on really high quality music that's copyright free is super important. To me, music sets the ground for your whole video. It sets up the structure and like the heart of the video. It can be really hard to find music that isn't like, you know, sort of YouTube stock music sounding, but Thematic makes it really easy. So Thematic pairs up with independent artists who can upload their music to the platform, and then creators can use that music without any risk of copyright strike by just including a credit in the description box. It's been really cool to have some of my music actually on Thematic and my songs have been used in over 180 YouTube videos, which I just think is the coolest thing ever. I love the thought of my music being the soundtrack to someone else's life and thoughts. It's like actually so beautiful to me. It's completely free. There is a premium version, which is just $7.99 a month. And with that, you get access to the premium song library, which is really, really good. There's a weekly matches feature where Thematic will actually curate songs based on the type of content that you make. I also love that you can search by lyrics. And I love the artist drops feature, which is where you can get notified when an artist that you follow on the platform releases a new song. I also just love the idea of YouTubers developing these relationships with independent artists and sort of supporting each other by musicians providing the service of their music and YouTubers getting to promote them and be sort of the first to their new releases. I think it's so cool. But yeah, that's Thematic. So thank you again, Thematic, to sponsoring this video and I'll get on with how we edit. So once I've dragged the music into my video, I'll start to cut up the clips based on the music. I personally like when I'm editing with music to exponential fade the music out instead of doing a crossfade. So crossfade is where they kind of overlap each other. I think something really powerful with music in videos is when you hear it fade out and it goes to silence. You sort of feel this natural shift that a new scene is coming and then when music fades in from the silence it really sets that new tone versus crossfade it gets a little muddy and the structure doesn't stand out as much but that's just my personal taste. And I like to let things sort of move with the cadence of the music, if that makes sense. Once I've dragged my music in and I've shaped it, I move on to adding voiceovers. I like to use voiceovers for any part of the video that I'm not vlogging, but I want the viewer to know what's going on. I also like to use voiceovers in this sort of journal entry context. With the journaling voiceover that I do, I like to think about that in tandem with some of the later visual elements that are coming in because like I said in the beginning, I really want these videos to be reflective of what's actually going into my physical journal. So I try to just like keep in mind where I might want to put that into the journal or where I might want to draw something in my journal and have that corresponding to those pages in here. So to do that for both of those, I just record into my phone, airdrop it to myself, drag that file right into GarageBand, and then just go through the menu to apply the telephone filter. There is a de-esser plugin built into GarageBand, but I don't think it's very good. So I prefer to use the de-esser or the denoise in Premiere. And I'll show you right now the differences between all those things. So normally when I'm doing this, I literally will just hold my phone here and be talking. So this is what it sounds like when I put on the telephone filter with no de-esser, with, <laughs> with no de-esser. Then this is what it sounds like when I put on the telephone filter with the de-esser in GarageBand. So if I go <laughs> this is me talking with the de-esser in GarageBand. This is me talking without the de sh without the de-esser in GarageBand. Then if I take that audio without the de-esser and put it into Premiere and add the de-esser within Premiere, this is what it sounds like. And this is without the de-esser in Premiere. There are definitely also just better de-essers than even the one in Premiere, but you have to pay for them, so I'm not doing that. I also use GarageBand to add in a lot of sound effects, so like message alerts, 
little things like that. If you have a Mac, GarageBand is free and you can just start right there. Once I'm happy with the voiceovers and the sound and the like general body cut that I have of the video, I open a new sequence and I start piecing together pieces from the video that I want to include in the intro. Sometimes I end up starting with the intro and videos where I do that always take me just like so much longer and I think that it's nicer to have an intro that's previewing what's going to be in the rest of the video as opposed to sort of making an intro from scratch that winds up being a minute and a half long of me rambling which is kind of what I do sometimes but the process of building out the intro normally also has me set up my tablet and start to get into adding these sort of extra visual elements. This is another thing that what I'm doing is not necessarily the best, most cost efficient or efficient way of doing it. It's just kind of what I've put together and I have access to. My boyfriend Nate is a really talented artist and he did graphic design in his undergrad, so I have access to a lot of his equipment, which is also why I feel like I can't really tell you in good faith to buy any of this stuff because I haven't even bought it. But it is a really nice tablet. You can do the same thing definitely on an iPad. I know that a lot of YouTubers that do animations like this or drawings like this will use an iPad and procreate. And I'm going to link a video and also put a card right here of someone that talks about how they've done these sort of doodle animations right on their phone. Just know that you don't necessarily need Adobe Suite or a fancy tablet to put really nice little hand drawings into your videos. But because this is how I know to do it, I'm just going to show you what I do. So something that I really like to do is to use brushes in Photoshop that look like real paint. I like the real oil brushes because you can blend the colors and I use the Kyle Real Oils 01 brush in a lot of videos because I think the texture looks really nice and messy. You can do this with any color, I just always end up using the red and white for some reason. So now I'm going to show you how I do the paint coming apart animation. I start by writing out a word or phrase that I want to fly in or out, and then I make a new layer to redraw the same word, trying to create relatively similar strokes, and each time making it in a new layer. You can also use these redrawn layers to create a kind of squiggly back and forth animation like this one. But to create the flyout, we're going to draw a few more frames before we animate. I continue to create new layers to draw what will be the next frame of the animation, using the layer beneath as reference. Each layer I draw the letters pulled further apart and messier, so it's kind of like they're being torn away. I know it's kind of hard to see, but I'm hiding the layer two below so that I can just see the layer I'm on and the layer immediately under it, and then drawing with the white and red paint extended a little bit further out each time. As you can see, I start getting more and more illegible and squibblier and start adding these little loose pieces around layer nine or 10. The more layers you add and the more similar each layer is to the one before it, the smoother your animation will be. Here I'm going back through and adding some wispy lines to the previous layers because I wanted to create a little more motion. The final few layers are basically just a few tiny wisps on the very outer edges. So once you've drawn all your frames, you can either animate them right in Photoshop or import the Photoshop files into your Premiere project and animate them there. Animating in Photoshop is really convenient, but there are a few advantages to doing it in Premiere that I'll get into later. To animate in Photoshop, open up the timeline through the window dropdown and select Create Frame Animation. There's a little menu button on the upper right side of the timeline where you can select Make Frames from Layers. This will automatically put your layers into the timeline and you'll be able to set the duration for each frame by option clicking it in the timeline or select all of the frames and option click to set the duration for each one. Press the space bar to play your animation. You can export this animation by going to File, Export, Render Video, and if you want to keep the transparent background, make sure that the alpha channel under Render Options is set to Straight Unmatted. Once it exports, you can add it into your project and overlay it on anything you want. I 
I also do drawings in Photoshop, again creating new layers and tracing over the previous ones to create what will become frames, and making subtle changes like either changing the color or making slight movements. For this one, I'm going to show you how I animate it in Premiere instead of Photoshop. So once I'm happy with my frames, I'll open up my Premiere project and go to File, Import, find the PSD file, and then it's important to import as individual layers. Make sure you select all of the layers that you want for the animation. Then you can drag them over whatever footage you want and set the duration for each. Once you have it how you'd like, you can select all the layers that are now frames in your animation and right click to nest them as their own sequence. Then you'll be able to move and adjust the nested sequence and all the frames will receive the same adjustments. What I like about doing this as opposed to animating in Photoshop and exporting it is that you can still go into Photoshop and make adjustments to the layers and once you save in Photoshop, the files will be updated in your Premiere project. I realized as I was editing this video that I would need to split it up into two parts. It's a lot of information to take in at once. If anything was confusing, please let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to clarify. In the next video, I'll go over how I add mixed media elements, typewriter animation, and adding other text. But for now, I'll show you how I do this handwriting lined up with voiceover as inspired by Lil the Cyborg. So basically all you'll need to do for this is to screen record yourself handwriting on a tablet or a phone and then remove the background. One issue of doing this in Photoshop is that you can't include a cursor in the screen recording because since it's the same color as the text, you won't be able to color key it out. I use this free program called Cursorcerer that allows you to make your cursor disappear with a keyboard shortcut. I record my screen using QuickTime, which is automatically installed on Macs. I choose a specific area to record, which is just the black part of my Photoshop file, and then on a new layer I write with white ink and the cursor hidden. Once I'm done with the writing, I drag the screen recording into Premiere and use the color key under Video Effects to remove the background. You can use this key to remove any background color. And then if it's not looking quite right, you can play with the adjustments in the effect controls. Once I have the background removed, I can customize it a lot more, scale and drag it to where I want. I always pick where I want it based on where it's going to end up once it's fully written out. If I want it to be black writing on white paper, I simply go back to the effects panels and choose invert, and I'll mess a little bit more with the settings in effect controls. Syncing the writing with the timing of the voiceover is a bit tedious and annoying, and if anyone knows a better way, please let me know. I basically play the audio against the writing and then option click the screen recording to open up the speed duration and change it kind of estimating how much quicker it needs to be to line up with the audio. I do this making a cut at each segment that isn't lining up and playing around with different percentages. If I need a pause, I'll option click the segment and create a frame hold. I find that on average, my speaking voice is at about 500% of what my writing is.